All righty. Um, tonight we're continuing our series uh, in the book of Genesis. And tonight we come to the story of Isaac and Rebecca and, and where their story begins. Isaac, as you may remember, was Abraham's son. The son God had promised to Abraham and Sarah so many years before. Um, and, and as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, uh, he was born when they were very, very old. Uh, and Rebecca, well, we're going to get to know her here in just a minute. Isaac is now a grown man. He's wealthy, like his father. And as Jane Austen would say from the first line of Pride and Prejudice, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of good fortune must be in want of a wife. <laughs> now, we assume that that was the case with Isaac. And it was certainly what Abraham wanted for Isaac. Abraham was now very old and very, very rich. And as the Bible says in Genesis 24:1, the Lord had blessed him in every way. Abraham and his family lived in the land of Canaan. And, and in vacation Bible school, I remember when I was growing up, we would used to sing songs about Canaan land. You all ever do that? Remember that? Okay. But at this point in history, Canaan was not yet what it would become. Abraham and his family were outsiders. The inhabitants of Canaan worshipped a multitude of gods, and they followed some rather barbaric customs. Abraham and Sarah followed and obeyed the one true God, Yahweh. And as today's story begins, Sarah has passed away. And Abraham knows that it might not be too soon or too far in the future before he passes away, before he dies as well. So it was time for him to fully prepare Isaac to carry on what God had begun in Abraham. So one day he called on the senior servant of his household and he said to him, promise me that you won't get a wife for my son from among the Canaanite people. Go back to my home country, to my extended family, and find a wife for him there. And the servant says back to him, and, and if she's not willing to leave her home and come live in a faraway land, should I send Isaac there? And Abraham was adamant, absolutely not. God brought me to this land, and he's promised it to my descendants. So she needs to come here. And if you can't find anyone who will come here, then you're off the hook. Don't worry about it. The servant loaded up ten camels with all kinds of good things from his master, from Abraham. And he set out for what we now consider Syria. And when he arrived in town, he rested his camels near a well and it was late in the afternoon or early evening and the time at that time there were a lot of women who would go to the well to get water and 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 I mean that was just one of the times when they would go okay and now you can see all of that at the very beginning of Genesis 24 that's where we're going to be tonight and that's kind of a synopsis of the first 11 verses or so. Now look at Genesis 24, verses 12 and 14. 12 through 14, I'm sorry. And this is the servant speaking. Lord, God of my master Abraham, he prayed, give me success today and show, show kindness to my master Abraham. I am standing here at the spring where the daughters of the men of the town are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I say, 
please lower your water jug so that I may drink. And who responds, drink and I'll water your camels also. Let her be the one that you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Pretty strategic <laughs> request there. Pretty specific request coming from this servant. I think that shows us a little bit maybe of his faith or at least the faith that he had in Abraham's God that that, that was going to happen. Okay, He knew that such a response, that if he asked that and he got that kind of a response, that that would indicate that this woman who he was looking for was, was probably very hospitable, was very thoughtful and, and, and kind and caring. Basically the type of woman that he was hoping to find for Isaac. So no sooner had he finished praying when Rebekah the star of today's story, arrives at the well. And the writer here specifically mentions that she was very beautiful. There are not a lot of times, especially in the Old Testament, when Scripture says, points out, that someone was very beautiful or someone was attractive. That's just not something that's pointed out a whole lot in Scripture. Now, we know that Sarah was. We saw that when, when Abraham and Sarah first started going out, and he was, he, he, he was, you know, he played the I'm your brother thing. You know, tell, t tell folks that I'm your brother so they're not going to kill me kind of thing. So we know that Sarah was beautiful, but here we see that Rebecca was beautiful as well. And the servant said to her, please give me a little drink of water from your jar. And you can probably guess what Rebecca said. Look at verses 19 through 20. It says, when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I'll also draw water for your camels until they have had enough to drink. And she qu quickly emptied her jug into the trough and hurried to the well again to draw water. She drew water for all his camels. And this whole time, the servant, you know, is watching her, keeping an eye on her, seeing what she's going to do. And without speaking a word, he just watches. And I love how the Bible describes this. Look in verse 21. The man silently watched her to see whether or not the Lord had made his journey a success. Well, I'd say that his prayer was answered pretty quickly. He prayed it, and then the first woman he sees coming out is the one, is Rebecca. She's the one. Right on the money. Does exactly what it was that he had prayed for. <laughs> I, I just think that's kind of remarkable, you know? I mean, he prayed believing in faith that that was going to happen, that God was going to show that. And, and it was the first one, the first woman that came out. How many of us pray with that kind of faith? I know I had difficulty praying with that kind of faith at times. But as a way of saying thanks for the kindness, he ended up giving her a ring for her nose and two gold bracelets. And then he asked, who is your father? Well, it turns out that her father was a man named Bethuel. His father was Nahor. I forgot to turn this thing on, so... Our person over there is not hearing anything. Let's see if she turns it back on or turns it on. Sorry. Anyway, his father was Nahor, who was also the father of Terah, who was the father of Abraham. And this meant that Rebekah came. 
from the right family. She was Abraham, part of, part of Abraham's extended family. Okay? It meant that they were second, third cousins somewhere down the line. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't take the time to actually map all that out. But they're related, okay? Now, today, that might seem a little strange, okay? But in those days, that was very acceptable, okay? It was even preferable because Abraham said, find somebody from my family. Now, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and tell you now that there are several aspects of this story that reflect some ancient cultural values and ancient cultural customs that, that, that we don't follow anymore, okay? It, it was a different time. So, so just don't get bogged down when you read Scripture. Don't get bogged down in, in those differences that there are, okay? Let's, let's not expect an ancient culture to have a post-modern view of the world, okay? Because they don't. This is an important story in the biblical narrative, and there's quite a bit for us to learn here. Rebecca said to the ser servant, We have plenty of room in our house for you and your camels. You're welcome to come stay with us. And the servant stopped right where he was and worshiped the Lord. Look at verses 26 and 27 here in Genesis 24. It says, Then the man bowed down, worshiped the Lord, and said, Praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his kindness and faithfulness from my master. As for me, the Lord has met me has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. So Rebecca went home to tell her family to prepare for company while the servant followed behind her. Now Rebecca had a brother named Laban. And when he saw the expensive jewelry that she was wearing as she's coming up, he he kind of snapped to attention, okay? He was eager at that point to extend a warm welcome to whoever it was that she was bringing home. Now, just as an aside, I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to get to know Laban a little bit better probably here in a couple of weeks. We're going to take a look at Laban, okay? Uh, and, and, and how he finds his way back into the story uh, here with Isaac. So when the servant arrives, Laban invited the entourage to come in and eat. And the servant said, first, I want to tell you why I'm here. And Laban said, okay, lay it on us, tell us. And the servant recounts the entire story about Abraham being wealthy and Sarah giving birth to a son in her old age. And now the boy Isaac is grown and ready to be married. And Abraham wants Isaac to marry a woman from his native land. He told him all that had happened up to that point in our story. And then he asked Laban for permission to take Rebekah back to Isaac so that they could be married. And Laban said, you know, it seems like the Lord is in this. Yeah, you think? Okay. So you have my blessing. She can go with you in 10 days. Now, I don't have a clue why Laban wanted her to stick around for 10 days. Maybe it was because he, 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 he simply couldn't bear the thought of his sister leaving. Maybe it was because he had some, some schemes that he wanted to try and negotiate for a better arrangement for himself. Either way, the servant said, you know, I need to leave right away. Let's just do this so that I can leave. And Laban said, well, let's see what Rebecca has to say about it. Look down in verses 58 and 59, if you would. It says, they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she replied, I will go. 
So they sent away their sister Rebekah with the one who had nursed and raised her and Abraham's servant and his men. Now, Isaac comes into the picture at this point. He's at home. He's living in the desert region of the Negev in what is now southern Israel. He went out one evening to take a walk in the field and to meditate. In other words, to pray. And in the distance, he could see camels approaching. So he began to move in their direction. And then he sees Rebekah. She catches his eye. She turned to the servant and asked, Who is that man coming to meet us? And the servant said, He's my master. In other words, this is the guy that you came to marry. And so then Rebecca covers her face with a veil because that was the custom. She's introduced to Isaac and before long, their husband and wife. And I especially like the way the living, the New Living Translation uh, puts the final sentence in today's story. I'm going to read verse 67 here in verse or in chapter 24 out of the New Living Translation. It says, And Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent, and she became his wife. He loved her deeply, and she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. This is a great story. You need to read the whole chapter, obviously, since there's 67 verses in it. I wasn't going to read the entire chapter uh, now. Um, but you need to read that chapter at some point if you haven't for, for a while because it's a great, great story. But there are two things that are happening throughout this entire narrative. First of all, the hand of God is at work in these events as they unfold. He's putting his plan into, into place and, and, and preparing for his promises that he had made to Abraham so long ago to be fulfilled. He's behind everything that happens. And secondly, each of the main characters in this story puts themselves in a position to be moved along by the hand of God. God is going to do what he intends to do. The question is, where are you when that begins to happen? Will you be on the inside taking a part? Or are you going to be on the outside looking in? The characters in today's story made sure that they were on the inside. And we can learn something from each of them. So in the time that we have remaining, I want to take a look at the three main characters in this story and see what we can learn from their lives. Our objective isn't to find a way to get God to fit into our plans. Our objective is to find a way to fit into his plans. The characters in this story give us an example to follow. And I believe if you do what they did, you're going to you're going to find the hand of God moving your life along in the way that he wants it to go. So first we're going to look at the servant. Abraham gave this man a tremendous task. Find a wife for my son. By the way, no pressure here, but if, but if you fail, just know that the future of Israel depends on your choice. It's quite a task. And yet, this servant went about doing it in the right way. When Abraham asked him to make an oath that he would get this job done, he took the oath. He made sure that he was straight on the details. As in, you know, what if she doesn't come back here? Can, can I come back and get Isaac and go there? No? no okay. Well, then I, I won't do that then. He planned. 
and he prepared for the journey, taking an entire team with him along with him. I mean, 10 camels worth of stuff with him, including some valuables that he knew he was going to need so that he wasn't going to arrive at the family's home empty-handed. And even more importantly, he made it a matter of prayer. Genesis 24, verse 12, says, Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. And when God came through, when God answered his prayer, he immediately stopped what he was doing and worshiped God. We saw that in verses 26 and 27. Then the man bowed down, worshiped the Lord, and he said, Praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his kindness and faithfulness from my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. He did everything right. But do you know what I like best about this servant? We don't even know his name. Have you ever thought about that? This story refers to him only as the servant. He was extremely important to this story, to what happened. But we don't even know his name. Why is that? Because his name isn't nearly as important as his task. Even in his prayers, you see that his focus isn't on himself, but it's on his master. It's on Abraham. God was able to use this servant because he wasn't the type of man who was going to say, I'm not an important person, but I have an important job to do. And I intend to do it well. That's what we need to do as well. Can you imagine what might have happened if that weren't the case? What about in your own life? When it comes to things that God asks you to do, do you have the thoughts you know, this isn't about me. It's about what God wants me to do. This is, this is about the God that I serve. This is the part, the part that he wants me to play in, in the narrative of my life. I don't need top billing. I don't even need any billing at all. Just let me do what I'm supposed to do. Harry S. Truman was the first to be quoted as saying, it is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. That attitude is, a, is the kind of attitude that God can use very well. I'm not an important person, but I have an important job to do and I intend to do it well. That was the servant's attitude. And it's no wonder that God was able to use him. Now let's look at Rebecca. When you read this story, you can see why God would use her and why he would choose to bless her in such a tremendous way. Like the unnamed servant, she does everything right. She meets a man when she's at the well to draw water. She doesn't know him, had never seen him before, had never met him before. But when he asks for a drink, she responds with kindness and then some. Not only can you have a drink, but I'll water all your camels as well. When he asked for a drink, she could have said, the well's right there. 
go get a drink if you're so thirsty. I'm kind of busy. I got things to do. She could have said with a heavy sigh, I guess so. But that's not at all what she did. Her response was to go above and beyond what she was asked. And when it came time to decide whether or not she would actually leave with the servant to marry a man in a foreign land who she had never met before in her life, she chose the path of adventure. She chose to do it right then. And then after she became Isaac's wife, she was, in the words of the Bible, a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. Most people in the same circumstances, uprooted, far from home, suddenly married to a stranger, where he lived in his house, tent, with all of his people, none of which you know, they would normally be the ones who needed comfort. But not Rebecca. She saw that her husband was hurting, and she helped him to find peace. God was able to use Rebecca because she was a strong woman with a servant's heart. Her attitude could probably be described this way. I will serve and strengthen those whom God brings into my life, wherever it may take me. There's no limit to what God can accomplish if you're willing to serve others. Now keep in mind that being a servant doesn't make you subservient. It doesn't make any, anyone less than anyone else. Being a servant is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. And when you commit yourself to serving others, you're going to find God's hand at work in the details of your life. And now let's look at the third character whose example we need to follow. Let's look at Isaac. Now Isaac in this story only has kind of a cameo, if you will, okay? But it's still an important scene that he's in. The Bible says that he was out in the field taking a walk and meditating. Now, I told you that he, that meant that he was out praying, and that is what it means, okay? But, but from what I can find in looking at, at, at some different commentaries, the Hebrew word for meditating in this instance can be translated not only prayer, but it can also be translated as complaining or lamenting. In other words, there he was out in the field pouring his heart out to God. He was still distressed over the fact that his mother had passed away. It, 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 it still broke his heart. And so he's out in the field doing the only thing he knows how to do, which is, which is praying, crying out to God in despair, wanting his pain to cease. Probably asking a lot of whys. Why did you take her? Who of us hadn't done that? He's probably a little distressed over the fact that he knows it won't be long before his father's gone as well. He may have been crying out and praying about that. 
He simply didn't know what the future was going to hold. He didn't know how he was going to faithfully carry out his family lineage because he wasn't married. And then Rebecca shows up. And the Bible says that he loved her deeply. At a time in history when marriages were more of a practical arrangement than some kind of a romantic adventure. The Bible makes it very clear that Isaac loved Rebekah very much. And the Bible also says that Rebekah was a comfort to Isaac. Now in order to receive comfort, you have to open your heart to that person. You have to be transparent. No games, no facades. That's who Isaac was. He was transparent with God. He was transparent with his wife. He was generous with his heart. And he wasn't afraid to love. God was able to bless Isaac with a woman like Rebekah because he made his heart ready for a woman like Rebecca. If you want the hand of God to move your life along, then open your heart. Open your heart to God and to those that He's placed in your life. Isaac's contribution to this story can be summed up in one simple phrase. Here is my heart. God is waiting for each of us to say the same thing. God had a plan throughout Genesis for the people of Israel. And He has a plan for each of us today as well. He has a plan for this church, for this community that we're in, for your family, for all of our futures. The question is, will you be inside taking part of those plans or on the outside looking in? Isaac wasn't perfect. Rebecca wasn't perfect. We're going to see that in the weeks to come. But there's a reason why God was able to use them and the servant. There's a reason why these indi individuals found a place in the purpose of God. And it's a lesson that we can learn from them. If you'll put yourself on the back burner and put the work God has called you to do and the people God has called you to serve on the front burner, and if you'll give them all your heart, there will always be a place for you in the purpose of God. I'm not an important person, but I've got an important job to do. It involves serving God and serving others with all my heart. That should be our prayer every day. Yes, ma'am. We, we had to teach this a few weeks ago to the children, and so I did some research on that. And when we go back to the...